What would you do if with a swing of your sword, thousands were obliterated? That is the question that begins our adventure through Chained Echoes, a question that leads to many others, often with no answers. Others with too many answers. Philosophies clashing and the world shaking under a power no man should have control over. But perhaps I'm getting ahead of myself. Chained Echoes is an indie turn-based RPG with a number of unique twists on the formula. It has a 16-bit art style, but often has a smoothness to it that makes it feel all its own. It was created by Matthias Linda, a singular person. While not entirely alone, he did have some help for art and music, but that fact has retroactively made this game even more impressive than it was to play. This is a very, very polished experience. I came out with a number of criticisms here or there, but it was never something I'd say didn't have work put in. This thing here could have had another pass. This other thing, some more tuning. Always feeling like they had something here, something amazing and grand, but just barely missed the mark. But never that it lacked polish. In the course of writing this script, meanwhile, I realized I find it a lot easier to vocalize criticisms than it is to speak of parts I liked. Things I like or enjoy. As much as I am sure this is a personal failing, I want to emphasize here that I am not dogging on the game. I genuinely liked it. Think it is a must-play RPG. Every criticism here is out of appreciation and hope for potential future projects. Maybe Chained Echoes too. So everything I criticize going forward starts from a base that I enjoyed. To further emphasize this, here's a rattle off of things I like without context because I couldn't fit it into the script anywhere else. I like the music, the world, the characters, the gameplay, enemy designs, though this literally is the Great Wood boss from Final Fantasy XII. I enjoyed this game, there is no denying that. The fact that this was all one person makes this project make even more sense. This is a labor of love, and that much is very clear. It is a game that very much tells you a lot about its creator and what they probably played through their years. The way enemies are handled is very Chrono Trigger. The story and characters heavily make me think of Xenogears and especially Final Fantasy's Ivalice, both from 12 and Tactics. For every bit of inspiration I could see, there was plenty of the experience where I did not where there was no other experience I could say, this reminds me of that. Matthias has his own plans and thoughts for the story that was created, yet both the inspirations and the uniqueness impressed me at points. Points where the stories were similar, where they differed, where unique twists were added, all of it comes together in a sometimes convoluted, not a derogatory word, arguably the game would be bad if it wasn't convoluted, yet cohesive whole. It's a game that came highly recommended by many people, and it very easily won me over with adding to the chorus. And amazingly enough, this is only about a 45 hour long RPG to 100%. I got all achievements, even did some farming. A big part of what won me over was the gameplay, so let's start with that, and discuss both the good and the bad. First, we have field exploration, which typically is the most simple part of any RPG, and yet many of them screw it up. With two small complaints, exploring areas in Chained Echoes is a good experience. Movement is smooth and fast. A battle you weren't expecting is easy to flee. I count that as field play because all enemies are visible on the field, except for the times they aren't. The fast travel system is super easy to use. There's lots of items and secrets to find, and mid-game rewards that make finding them all easier to do. You do get reasons to revisit areas, including several side quests. A small criticism, though, is the final act and how it relates to the beginning of the game. With your first foray into a field zone, you get introduced to the reward board. Several of the areas of the game have a list of tasks to do for further rewards. Exploring, finding treasure, defeating specific enemies in certain ways, stuff like that. One of the things is side quests all having a slot on the board. In Act 2, you get introduced to side quests. On the fast travel map, all side quests available are shown with a blue icon. The game will also usually give you a faded out splash screen to tell you there are new side quests. I appreciate this. The problem is that it sort of implies all side quests will work like this. In Act 4, there are several completely hidden quests. If you don't take the time to re-explore areas during the end game, you won't find the hidden quests. That makes sense though, right? It's time for the final dungeon. Of course, everything on the reward board is now available. All those listed side quests can be done. But there's no icon. 
There's plenty of secret stuff which is not on the board, or technically they are by relation, but none of that has a side quest. One of the endgame secrets is essentially a big side quest, but does not have the icon. Instead, it is all locked behind a side quest that is considered complete long before most of what this secret quest entails. This side quest has no icon and is found only by accidentally passing by a tree in the first zone. If there is something, anything that hints you to come over here, I also coincidentally skipped it. This quest has to do with the town of Basil. I had not visited Basil in the endgame, but had made several revisits throughout the game. Maybe there was an NPC to tell me about this quest? I would have seen it because of one of the brilliant ideas added. There's a lot of NPCs in RPGs. Often, they have no new dialogue through a whole game. But you don't know that unless you talk to them after every major event and see, oh, they don't even change dialogue when their home burns down. You just get to watch them stand there, in front of their burned down home, forever. Not even a single remark about the beast or army that caused this tragedy. Here in Chained Echoes, every NPC with new dialogue will have a red dot next to their dialogue box. This is such a small thing, but is huge for ease of play. I know for sure I've talked to someone without needing to check. Unless I'm specifically prodding a secret or looking to find what NPC gave me a hint for something else, I know that person has nothing for me. Even better is that with little exceptions such as shops, NPCs don't lock you in place. If you are specifically looking for that hint, and you know that the first of this NPC's three dialogue boxes isn't part of it, you can walk away without having to button through the dialogue first. This all is great, but we're getting away from the original point. That point being, unless there was one of these red dots, there was no way to know that quest was there. Which seems like a really, really weird exception. Sure, the reward board says there is a quest there, but the game's map says I don't. I must be missing something else. I'll come back later after every other thing I can currently do. But in reality, it is in the reverse. An entire chain of tasks is locked behind this seemingly hidden quest. The other complaint is the Sky Armor Exploration. It in itself is fine, but it's a much faster way to move around the map, so you'll mostly be re-exploring places in your Sky Armor. That's still fine. My issue is once again, Basil. This section of the map will automatically dismount you from the Sky Armor, as will basically every town. The problem comes in that often you have to go completely around the town cell to get to your goal. Some towns are just dead ends. It's a very small complaint, but it still happened often enough to get under my skin. And like I said, if the game is expecting me to blindly re-explore an area to find the one tree with a quest, making it harder to explore just compounds the issue. Worst with this quest issue is that there was an easy way around this. Make the reward to this quest a member of your clan. Part of the game is re-exploring areas for more clan members. There's no real way to know where you are missing someone except to explore or use the built-in hint system. There's a hint system for finding these NPCs, but maybe not one for this one side quest. I'm harping on it, definitely making a mountain out of a molehill, but it feels emblematic of what I said in the intro. There isn't a lack of polish, but there's always that one thing that seems off, feels wrong or underdeveloped. It's such a specific thing in this case that it just feels weird it is like this. Though again, will be real awkward if there is in fact an NPC I was going to run into anyway to tell me to check this tree. Otherwise, yeah, exploration and all is usually speedy, easy, and fun to do. There's a good amount of linear areas, but plenty of more open feeling areas. Though most might actually be of the linear kind, that's not something I'd say is a criticism outright, but something players might question. So let's move on to the main gameplay. This is a turn-based RPG, so everyone takes turns hitting each other. A character's agility stat will give them more turns. So it's not traditional turn-based, so Final Fantasy Pyrrhus will hate this as much as they hate Final Fantasy XVI. There are two layers to this combat that we'll take separately. Ground combat and sky armor combat. We'll start with the ground combat since I'd say that's the main combat of the game. The combat of both sections revolves around this bar in the top left, the overdrive bar. Nearly every action with few exceptions will move the arrow to the right. Controlling the position of the arrow is important to victory. Enemy moves have an effect too, which is very key for some of my issues. The orange zone is a neutral zone. Green is where you want to be, and red will be the death of you. 
When the bar is in the green zone, your party gets some buffs and is in overdrive. If you overshoot and get into red, you're overheated and the enemies are buffed. Enemy damage can be pretty high as a base, so buffing their damage with overheat can just end you instantly. While on overdrive or overheat, you start getting icons in the top left, with one of six meanings. Every skill in the game has one of these icons, based on what they are. The options are... Physical attacks, magical attacks, buffs, debuffs, utility, and healing. Using a skill of the matching icon will shift the arrow far to the left. You will be given four player turns to use this icon before it changes, and making use of this icon will give you a random new icon. This is how you manage the bar. When you get the opportunity to match the icon, match it and maintain your momentum. This can actually be really cool. You are encouraged to use a variety of skills when building your characters to ensure you can manage the bar. But I don't just mean character to character, but across your whole eight person team. Yes, eight people. Every member of your party can have a partner you can swap to. This can cover weaknesses in that character or be a backup fighter of similar niche. Mage 1 just got their face beat in and you can't heal them reliably? Or maybe they got a bunch of debuffs. Swap to Mage 2 and use their toolkit. The swap will also shift the bar to the left a little, so it can be an emergency overdrive fix too. The issue is this only sounds so great on paper. A lot of the time it feels like it just gets in the way. The mechanic itself is so polished, so it works really well, but not enough is done with it. A whole like... Two bosses in the game have a special ability that shuffles the overdrive bar to make things more challenging. That's not enough. What if one of the bosses made it that you wanted to avoid the icons entirely to maintain overdrive? It's already RNG whether you get good icons or not. Play around with that more. The bar shuffle skill already has the overdrive choke points very tiny. Putting this at the top of the bar would hardly be different, but looks different enough to feel like more is being done. The game can go so many turns without giving you a good icon for your current setup. Your healer just went and started the overdrive with it asking for a heal skill. By the time it makes it back to them, the heal icon will have become a physical attack. Well, your healer probably has none of those, and you need to heal because the boss did a big attack. Oops, that heal put you into overheat. While this isn't something that usually was an issue, it happened enough to be notable. You could argue that this risk is just part of it, but I don't know. Needing to hit defend a bunch during your burst phase usually isn't worth it. If the game disrupted you more often, you might try to be more strategic around it. But as it is, it more just ends up being secondary to just normal strategy. I also feel like the pairing system is underutilized. The proof of it is the stagger status. Stagger will force you to swap that character out with their partner, or they will be unable to act. They have an entire tutorial for Stagger. And then after that, maybe two whole fights in the entire game will use Stagger. More enemies using Stagger would give me more reason to actually use the swapping mechanic. With how the game works currently, I barely used it from Act 2 on. Be it because characters like Rob are kinda worthless beyond one or two specific skills, or because I already had a very strong, overwhelming plan in place. Buff the party while debuffing the enemy turn 1 and 2. Go ham with 3 attackers while my main buffer also now acts as the main healer. This worked for the entirety of the game, up to the super boss. Only a single boss in the game actually made me retool my build specifically to counter it. Its mechanic is inherently unfair and only has one counter, forcing you into one specific build or get extremely lucky. Even with the right build, this boss just can make you lose with bad RNG. The mechanics are there, fleshed out, good, but there's no room to develop them nearly as much as they deserve. There is so much that could be done, but I just don't get that chance. And this all isn't even getting into the leveling system for skills. The other side of the combat is Sky Armor Combat. This works in a completely unique way. The overdrive bar no longer has a green section, but has overheat at the left and right. Every battle starts the arrow at the middle. This, and all combat in Sky Armor, revolves around the gear system. The gear system replaces your ability to swap party members. Starting battle, you always start in gear 1. Hitting the swap button will rev you up to gear 2. There is no confirmation button, so careful of hitting the button as there's no undoing that. 
There was no undoing a swap in ground combat, but that had a two-button confirmation. Anyway, you can only rev your gear once per turn. So next turn, you rev again and it will be sent to gear zero. Next turn, rev up again to return to gear one. In gear one, actions will have no special multipliers and will move the overdrive bar to the right. Defend will go left. In gear two, actions have a double cost. Damage taken and received will go up, and actions taken shift the bar to the left. Defend will go to the right. Finally, we have Gear Zero. You will take less damage, have no access to skills, and cannot affect the overdrive bar with attacking or defending. Attacking will, however, restore massive amounts of TP, balancing out the high cost in Gear 2. The tutorial for all this is the hardest part of the entire game. The entire game. Because it shows off the problems with Sky Armor combat in itself. To start, we have managing the overdrive bar with just your Sky Armor. You absolutely cannot let everyone stay in gear 1 for the first turn for setup of buffs and debuffs, or you will overheat on the right side. So turn 1, some characters must have higher TP costs. But then you also have to account for enemy count. Enemies will always shift the bar to the right. Even enemy Sky Armor, which theoretically could shift the bar left too, but never do. So if you're against a large group of enemies, you have to immediately go to gear 2 for everyone and hopefully thin the herd before they kill someone with the increased damage taken. Fail to do so, moving into the gear 0 recovery phase will probably mean your enemies drive the bar to the right side overheat and kill you before you can recover. Sometimes one mistake can snowball into an entire impossible fight that you just give up on the bar and just try to brute force the attempt. Eventually you can feel out the balance from encounter to encounter, but in this tutorial you have absolutely no skill variety since Sky Armor has its own leveling system for skills. Then the boss has the ability to act twice and has a super move. This super move can be used the same turn as a second party wide attack. The game warns you to swap to gear zero and defend to survive, but if you're not all in gear two, you can't do that. And as I said, you have to balance who is in what gear, so some characters will just not be in gear 2 for the swap to gear 0. So it's like, you have to learn all this at once with no toolkit, and hope you do it right. And it just never feels like you are. Once again, deep, complex mechanics with lots to think about, but I can't feel like I'm playing correctly. And yet by late game, Sky Armor fights were a foregone conclusion. Even the one boss fight where I went in with just random gear equipped because I was grinding proficiency as an aside, I won with strategy. I was completely outmatched, unprepared, and unsure of most every action I took. And I won from those odds. It wasn't because the random weapons were a good build or the boss was easy. Quite the opposite. It was a challenging fight. I did know how to use Sky Armor. I did know what I was doing. And yet it never felt like that. There always felt like something was missing, something more it could have done. There is one weapon type that gives you a skill to shift two gear levels, which works as a backward shift, but honestly I think this should have been base. You can shift upwards from 2 to hit 0, 0 can't shift down to 2, but you can otherwise shift in either direction from gear 1 or 2. Maybe let enemy sky arm do the same and have the overdrive bar do more though I fear that it might become too much of a chore this way. I mentioned that a weapon has skills. In Sky Armor, all skills are based on your weapons and proficiency. You choose one melee weapon and one gun. As you use those weapons, the Sky Armor pilot themselves ranks up with it. Ranking up both unlocks more skills with that weapon type, but gives permanent stat ups. So you're incentivized to do what I mentioned earlier, give everyone random weapons for grinding proficiency. It means when you do hit a real fight, a real challenge in Sky Armor, you probably will just die. It's faster to level this way, and technically is an excuse to scout out a boss fight before a legitimate try. But you still want to do this if you ever want to max out your proficiencies in a reasonable time. On the bright side, I never felt compelled to actively go grind for the most part. Maxing proficiencies in a 100% save file isn't really an option, it's a foregone conclusion. The only actual grinding I did happened with a different game mechanic, which is definitely something I have to give praise, being so anti-grind. 
A special brand of person will say that Dragon Quest XI needs grinding to beat an early game boss, and that changing strategy isn't an option. Well, people like them no longer have that excuse because you can't grind. Sure, you can grind out proficiency early for sky armors, or grind enemies on the ground to level up your skills, but the vertical momentum you can achieve is limited. Some skills on the ground level up with power boosts, others have cost reductions, and mostly don't seem to be ultra-acquired bonuses to be decent skills. A skill with a base 1.5 damage multiplier will become 2.0 damage multiplier at rank 3. A big increase, but far from earth-shattering. Instead, we have Grimoire Shards that are dropped by bosses and the reward board only. At max, I believe it is 48 Grimoire Shards, and your characters technically start at level 3. I like this. On average, leveling up feels more impactful. I get to choose from a whole list of stuff what I want. Is this skill super cool sounding? I can pick this first before anything else. I don't need to wait for a specific level, I just make my build now. At most, you're locked to sections of the board with level thresholds for that section. This can lock out arguably stronger stuff, so you do still get some of that level locking experience. But beyond that minimum, you can pick any order you want. When you are picking what you want, you're going to think more about it. It's not just an additional skill you got from hitting level 10. It's a skill you actively chose. A skill you picked out of all the options available. And if you actively chose a stat increase, you must be really wanting that stat, or want none of the other choices. Even if eventually you are forced to take plain stat-ups, and the stat-ups do really add up to mean a lot, it's because you went and got all your favorite picks first. You got to tailor your strategy before just beefing up with pure numbers. The game will give you free stat-ups at specific level-ups, but those additional picks are a conscious choice to hold off on. Leveling isn't our only way to upgrade our stats, though. We have gear, which I unfortunately have a problem with. There's so many new pieces of gear. Every new area, there is new gear to wear. There's like 10 levels of gear through the whole game, which means on average, you'll be changing armor every 4.5 hours. How much of that is spent on menus, cutscenes, and sky armor? The armor itself isn't the issue, but the upgrading of armor. You can upgrade any piece of armor or weaponry twice. This will give it a boost in power and an extra crystal slot. We'll talk about crystals in a bit. This costs both money and upgrade materials. The money? Still not a concern. The upgrade materials? This is where you might actually need to grind. Consider again that there are eight party member slots. You might not obtain enough materials to upgrade the gear of everyone you use, which means they're objectively weaker, and now you have less reason to swap to them in battle. Your frontrunner has a super strong new weapon, double upgraded, but your backrunner doesn't have an upgraded weapon because their weapon uses materials the healer's armor uses. So you upgrade them or let your healer fall behind. So you swap less in battle because swapping to that character is now just a waste. Or you could grind materials from enemies in the area. Oh wait, that material isn't farmable until the area after this one. So even then, sometimes it's not an option. Some characters will just have to not have good gear at points. Then when you consider there's 12 characters in total, it becomes a mess. The healer upgrade wouldn't be a big deal if not for the crystal system. You could just leave their weapon unupgraded. But then you can't fit in the same crystals as before. This is your materia system. You can put a whole bunch of different effects on your characters. Higher resistances, elemental attacks applied, and stat-ups. All gear has two slots at base, upgraded twice to four slots. But you can only fit in three crystals. That's because crystals can be a size of one, two, or three, which basically exists to dilute the pool. Since if you grab most things at anything more than a size of one, you can't fit in three crystals to a piece of gear. At most, a piece can take one two-slot crystal. This might be okay if size had an effect on power, but it doesn't. There's a combining system. Combine crystals to make them stronger. At rank 5, they get stronger, and at rank 10, they hit their strongest. So you want to aim for one-slot crystals with high rank, max of 3 when collecting them, and high purity. Purity is how many times you can combine a base crystal to hit that 10 threshold. I'll get into collecting them more in a bit, but I don't want to get too far away from the gear point. 
healing power is affected by mind. So you're gonna put a mind crystal. It's a piece of gear, so it makes sense to put the cloak bonus crystal in, which reduces damage from 10 to 20%. Even with numbers as small as this game mostly keeps them, a 20% modifier is huge. Unfortunately, both of these are two slot crystals based on your poor luck. This is the best you could make without grinding. That means you need, need to upgrade every cloak the healer wears to have all four slots taking up materials. That or abandon some of the crystals. So you could probably save some materials by dedicating your healer to just healing and never upgrading new weapons. But then you just ruin any turn they take that is on the offensive. You're bringing in some attacks purely for the overdrive bar management aspect, but those attacks do nothing, because your materials went to every other weapon. It feels weird to purposefully let some members far behind just to keep a few strong members, in a game where an entire mechanic is that you bring in eight team members. It's fine overall because the game is on the easy side. I don't think anyone is coming in expecting Shin Megami Tensei, but I'd rather it be too easy to need the mechanics than not be able to use the mechanics properly and it being a saving grace that the game isn't too hard. Back to crystals, it gets even worse. This is the only part of the game I grinded, because I was trying to get better crystals. Every time you come to one of these shards, you can collect some crystals. You get more later in the game, better ones, and even can manipulate what type you get at the end. But until you get these bonuses, the most you get is a chain bonus. If you pick up a mind crystal, you have a higher chance of finding more. Chance. Chance. You could go several nodes without ever taking a crystal and never see another mind crystal. So not only are you trying to find a rank 3, one slot crystal, you might not even see the type you're trying to gather. Even with the best odds, you can struggle to find what you need. Nodes also don't respawn with a reload, they seem to be on a timer. Maybe every hour? There's a Fisher dude that's hourly too. But this fact means you're even limited in the one thing you might try to actively farm. It used to be worse too. Getting crystals is hard enough. But before a patch, removing crystals from gear would devalue the crystal. So you finally made that super good crystal, but can't use it until the end of the game without needing to go farm up a complete new one. Yes, the game is plenty easy without doing so, but you don't know that until you've beaten it. You don't know that until you've accidentally beat the super boss on what you intended to be a scouting run. Yes, really. So needing to gear 8 to 12 characters, upgrading the gear, putting crystals into each gear piece, it's just all too much. You can grind for materials, but most materials have pretty low drop rates. Not all of them can be stolen with Sienna either. Crystals you can farm, but they're less interesting than even the mindless slaughter of the same enemies over and over. At least combat is fun. I think the reasons for a lot of these issues comes back to the length of the game. The mechanics are deep, complex, and you can do so much with them. There's so many layers of gearing and mechanics that will fill an entire full RPG, but then it's such a short game that there's no room for any of it to breathe. To the point that I feel like this could just be a proof of concept for Chained Echoes 2. With how successful the game has been, we could see that. As this one stands though, I like what is there, but it truly doesn't feel like there's enough time to develop it all. Hell, there's a tutorial all the way in Act 3, in the back half of the game, for hate. How hate, aggro, enmity works. You're at the point where if there was a system in place, you stopped caring because you just dealt with the hand you were given. Sure, it's because you get a character based entirely around being a tank, but at this point it's too late. The game is more than half over, the tank sucks at doing damage you'll quickly find, and you already have been decimating nearly every encounter with overwhelming force. But like, there being so many pieces of gear? Would that be fine if the game was longer? Longer game means more room for different kinds of overdrive surprises, more time to build up strong crystals naturally, more time to do everything. Which comes to also affect what is probably the biggest and most common criticism, the story would have more time to develop. Before even playing the game, I'd seen on the Steam review page that someone loved the game, but hated the ending. Without going into details, I loved the ending. The issue is probably time. A lot happens in the game, a lot happens in the ending. 
With one exception in the mid-game, character motivations and the story all make sense. I've seen a bunch of criticisms after the fact about how some plot points don't make sense because of seemingly sudden character shifts. But in reality, the sudden shift is only sudden as far as story speed. Purely within the narrative aspect, there is nothing sudden about it. Days, weeks, months, time passes within the length of the game. Characters will be thinking to themselves in their own minds that the player never sees. But as far as gameplay is concerned, going from story section to story section will have things zip by as if characters don't have any time to breathe, let alone think on their own motivations. Everyone has heard the phrase, Rome wasn't built in a day. In Chained Echoes, it was. But only because Rome was built right in front of you across an entire hour of gameplay total. But as far as the story itself is concerned, Rome was not built in a day. I think the story is really, really good. Give some huge Matsuno vibes beyond just following similar themes. If you're a fan of the Evil East games, you will be right at home in Chained Echoes. But you won't think you're playing a Matsuno game, you are still playing a unique experience with a world I want to learn more of. Though again, I... I can't get this out of my head. I'm trying to barely glance over the story because of it being so great and not wanting to spoil, but there is one place where I truly feel the story loses itself and I want to talk about it and maybe have comments explain it to me. If you have played, please give a spoiler warning, then explain, if you can. I don't want to delete a comment that is answering what I asked for, but I don't want spoilers easy to see. So if you are convinced to play this game, maybe convinced by how far I'm going to prevent spoilers, please skip to the timestamp on screen to avoid spoilers. This is for people who have beaten the game since my issue involves info revealed later. You can also pause the video, head down to the description, and hit the timestamp for the next section. I even made sure to include this spoiler warning as part of the spoiler timestamp there, so that you don't click the wrong one and get put in the middle of spoilers. That enough time? Here we go. Why does Gwen seemingly mourn the loss of Three Vein at the end of Act 2? We eventually find that the Vein are his enemies, our enemies. We do not care about what happens to them, and even seek to kill them. But when they sacrifice themselves to turn back time, Gwen says, Three Vein had to die just because I was too slow. Is my strength fading, or was I too foolish? Before this, he panics because he's misread fate and needs to get Glenn to open the white door in his mind. And I notice another thing. Len asks where the Grand Grimoire is in this scene. But by this point, I'm pretty sure she knows what it looks like. It's... it's right there. Also, Bathraz seems to have more info than he's supposed to. He's with the Leonar Order, not Gwen, right? So how does he know she's not supposed to die here? Weird wording for simply regretting her death. If foreshadowing to the sequel of how a maiden defeats the Harbinger, it's pretty clumsy. Otherwise, pretty sure this scene was missed in a rewrite. But anyway, Gwen has Glenn keep the door open so that he does not freeze when the vein appear. I can see Gwen as being upset that he screwed up in his plans and is trying to fix things, but this wording, three vein had to die just because I was too slow. This sounds like something he should be happy about. The vein doing this plays right into his hands. Keep Glenn with the door open, and not only does the party get the Grand Grimoire, some vein are killed off. But he doesn't sound upset that yes, his power is indeed fading. He's in fact soon to die. He sounds upset that the vein, the things he wants to kill, are dead. He could be setting up a whole scheme of having Len die over and over at different points in the game, and Vayne dying to rewind time over and over. But no, he sounds upset. Am I misreading this? What is with this? There's a ton of stuff the game never explains because we're messing with forces we could never hope to comprehend. We have no idea who Gwen and June are meant to be, what the will is, who the masked being that gives the curse is. But this one just seems wrong. My conspiracy theory is that the plot did indeed much more closely match that of Ivalice. We're talking Final Fantasy XII in specific. The Vein are meant to be the Acuria. The Grand Grimoire, a weapon of the Vein, is the deifacted Nethysite. And Gwen? Gwen is Vena, a Vein who could not stand what his brothers and sisters had become. Whether June would have been another Vein or something else, I do not know. She's just as strong as Gwen, though. He may have been against his brothers, but still not wanted to kill them. 
The Grand Grimoire would have just been his version of giving Dr. Sid the method of creating manufactured Nethysite. And how did he get the Grand Grimoire from inside the Realm of the Vein? Maybe the sequel will explain further, but as it is, I don't get this scene. Chained Echoes, at the very least, is a proof of concept for a much larger adventure, that hopefully this will have funded an even bigger, more expansive sequel. The game's story and all heavily implies that there is to be a sequel, and I am more than willing to see what it has in store, to see these mechanics properly fleshed out and feel even more engaged. I don't need to feel like I'm playing some super hard game, but I do want to feel like using the mechanics is a requirement and not a chore. There's so much this can become, and I want to see it. I greatly enjoyed this game. Again, I want to state, I put mostly criticisms here, but it is so much out of love. I enjoyed my time here. I at most felt annoyed at crystals and needing to grind a bit for upgrading gear. Only for me to find new gear immediately in the next area. I am confident in my final summary. This is what would happen if you tried to paint the Sistine Chapel on an ordinary canvas. On the edges, you can see tiny details of a world beyond the canvas, but only some details. The majesty of the full picture will only be seen if you put it where it belongs. Give Linda a bigger canvas, and we might very well see a masterpiece. Thank you for watching this review on Chained Echoes. I hope you enjoyed, and perhaps were convinced to play the game for yourself. I love a good RPG story, and this was one that very much hit all the right spots for me. And then it had good combat to boot. There's so much more I could analyze if I went into every single moment, used all 40 hours of footage I have to make one mega review, but ultimately I think this covers the broad strokes. I do hope this review has made an impression and people want to see more. Though, we'll see. I will likely do more regardless of if people want to see more. Maybe see of stars when that comes out. Take care, and may the power of Anna Didhogs lay waste to your enemies. And of course, thank you to all your support over on Patreon, with an extra special thanks going to Altrios, Eamon al Khatib, Benjamin Hahn, Benjamin Rice, Bergy, Karsten Wayward, Ethan W., Fraser97, Jeremy Abbott, Jericho, Kevin Lowe, Mizella, Shana, Shimmering Blaze, T Rogue, Timmy, and Zero Two. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.